You are listening to One Nation Under Crime, a chronological true crime podcast. Each week, we go through our nation's history and discuss one case from each year, unless it's this episode, where it's a continuation of the previous year. Part two. But we start in 1800. I am Kayla. And I'm Leah. And this week, we are wrapping up 1804 with part two of Alexander Hamilton, Aaron Burr, and finally, we will get to the duel in Weehawken. So, uh, sources for this week, kind of the same exact ones as last week, guys. Real big shock. So, (laughs) Wikipedia, uh, Biography.com, Britannica Encyclopedia. Uh, Those are the main ones that I use. There is a good book that I actually have sitting over here, and it's called Duel. Um, by Thomas Fleming, and it goes through, uh, it actually compares both of the lives of Burr and Hamilton as it goes through their lives. Um, So if you wanted further reading on that. Last week, we went through the events that occurred in 1804 and the life of Alexander Hamilton. So now we're taking a total 180 and looking at the man who ended it all, Aaron Burr. Yes. I do want to make it clear again. That while I love Hamilton and American Musical, it is entitled Hamilton and therefore from the point of view of Alexander Hamilton. Um, So if you don't know much about Aaron Burr, I mean, prepare to be impressed because he he had his own accomplishments and um, life and his fair share of shady dealings, such as being arrested for treason. Yeah, well. So, February 6th of 1756, Aaron Burr Jr. is born in Newark, New Jersey, as the second child to Reverend Aaron Burr Sr. and Esther Edwards Burr. July 11th, 1804, Burr shoots Hamilton in a duel in Weehawken, which killed Hamilton and metaphorically ended Burr as well. Yep. September 14th of 1836, Burr died in a boarding house in Staten Island after having an immobilizing stroke two years earlier. Ugh. Mm-hmm. So, much like Hamilton, Aaron Burr Jr. had a bit of a rough upbringing, we'll say. One year after his birth, his father, Aaron Burr Sr., died uh, while he was the president of Princeton. And Burr's grandfather, on his mother's side, Jonathan Edwards, took over the position at Princeton for his late son-in-law, and then he moved in with the family. So he took over as president to Princeton after Aaron Burr Sr. died. He just took over everything that Sr. did, like he was the head of the family. Everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Until a year later, in 1758. Uh, Edwards, the grandfather, uh, died, and Burr's mother and grandmother also died in the same year. Oh. Burr and his sister were orphaned when he was only two. That's sad. The children were taken in by their maternal uncle, Timothy Edwards, and Burr attempted many times to run away due to physical abuse from his uncle. Mm. Um, but. Burr was only 13 when he was accepted as a sophomore to Princeton. Wow. And then at 16, he graduated with a Bachelor of Arts, but continued to study theology for another year. His grandfather, the one that took over for his dad at Princeton, um, was a widely known theologian. And so it's kind of said mm-hmm. that maybe he was trying to go in his footsteps right. of, of studying theology. But uh, Bird de- decided after that he was going to do intense theology studies under Joseph Bellamy. But two years into it, he decided he needed a career change. <laughs> that wasn't for him. Yeah. Wrong he, road. <laughs> when he was 19, he moved to Connecticut and studied law with his brother in law, so his sister's husband. Um, and studied law. Uh, But when Burr heard about Lexington and Concord in 1775, he put his law aspirations on hold and joined the Continental Army. Burr then fought under Benedict Arnold in Quebec. And that name? Yeah. And uh, 
Arnold commented on Burr's great spirit and resolution. Because of this, Burr was sent where he was a captain under General Montgomery until he caught a bullet in, in the, the neck, neck in Quebec. Quebec. So during the Battle of Quebec in 1775, um, you know, General Montgomery was killed. And Burr actually attempted to recover Montgomery's body once the battle was over. It's undetermined mm. whether he was successful. I couldn't find, I, I didn't see anything where it said for sure. Um, Burr had a stepbrother who, which I don't know how that works. Yeah. But it says he has a stepbrother. So it could have been because he was taken in by his uncle. Maybe they yeah, considered that yeah. a step. Yeah. So um, his stepbrother helped him get a position on George Washington's staff in the spring of 1776. But on June 26th, important date in history, in case anybody was wondering, 626. Um, <laughs> My birthday, the day of my birth. Um, clearly, back then it was very important as well. Um, everyone knew about it. But <laughs> on June 26th, he quit to be on the battlefield. He went on to save an entire brigade who was going to be captured once they landed um, in Man, like once the British came and landed in Manhattan, there was an entire group of men who were going to be captured mm -hmm. and Burr kind of found out about it ahead of time. And he went down there and like saved them and got them out. So he's a war hero too. He is. Um, so at this time, Israel Putnam was Burr's general. And while Putnam lifted Burr up as a hero, the next day, when George Washington's general orders came out, Burr's actions were not mentioned. Hmm. So Burr was infuriated that he was not mentioned um, because while the nation all thought that Burr was a hero, the best way to receive a promotion in the military at that time was through reports in Washington's general orders. So it's kind of like if you were named in this report, then like it's kind of widely known that you, hey, you're important and we should yeah. kind of lift you up. But you're kind of on the radar. Yeah. And they didn't, they weren't in Washington's general orders, which um, I'm not 100% sure. I don't remember the timeline of dates. But it could have been in this time. Because I wonder that, too. It could have been in this time that Hamilton was writing the Washington's general orders. Mm. You know? I'm not sure. I I'm not sure whether the years of the timelines match up, but I just thought about that. This might have also been where a rift between Burr and Washington started. Yeah. Uh, you know... It's not known for sure because there were other things that could have happened. Um, but Burr continued to follow Washington's orders during the war out of respect for his fellow soldiers. Um, but it was not without a chip on his shoulder. Mm. However, that did not prevent our wonderful, wonderful Aaron Burr from falling in love on the battlefield. Oh. Mm -hmm. In 1776, Burr was responsible for protecting 14-year-old Margaret Moncrief, the daughter of Staten Island-based British Major Thomas Moncrief. Burr, at the time, was 20. She was 14. Just okay. Kidding. Just going to make sure that that's clear. So Margaret somehow ended up behind enemy lines in Manhattan, and Washington promised Major Moncrief that his daughter would be safely returned to him, mm -hmm. which, I mean, it's kind of a lot. Like, he didn't have to do that. He didn't have to, you know, decide right. to protect her. Um, Till a wrench was thrown into the plan. Uh-oh. And Margaret was refusing to go back. Because her and Burr were in love. Oh. Mm -hmm. Very much in love with one another. That probably made Washington not so happy. So they tried to 
make it to where she could stay on that side. Didn't happen. And there was no way that Washington was keeping Margaret on their side during the war, and Moncrief was not letting his daughter stay with Patriots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the lovers were unfortunately split apart, and Burr moved on. Mm. Fourteen. <laughs> but remember at that time, it was not unusual for a 14-year-old girl yeah, to get married. Yeah, if they're forced. I'm just saying. That's, that's, that's too much for me. I and can't. even even with my grandparents, they're, you know, young. 14. Young. It's, I can't. Anyway. I mean, I can't imagine it, mm -mm. but. So, after this, uh, Burr was promoted to lieutenant colonel in 1777 for Malcolm's Additional Continental Regiment. Uh, Colonel William Malcolm was called away from his regiment frequently, um, and that left Burr in charge of roughly 300 men wow. at, at any given time. Kind of important. Mm -hmm. So the regiment was successful in warding off many nighttime raids that were focused um, kind of on central New Jersey. Um, and they also stopped the British who tried to attack by water. The Battle of Monmouth took out a lot of the regiment just due to British fire. And Burr actually had a heat stroke during this battle. Burr was then reassigned to Malcolm's regiment. So he moved from the additional regiment to just the regiment. Mm -hmm. So maybe the more important one, I suppose. And this was a big step up for Burr. And this new regiment, he was over, he was significantly under the command now instead of, you know, Colonel Malcolm. He was now under General Alexander McDougall who was very prominent and influential in the Revolutionary War, very famous general in that time. But it was not long after, in March of 1779, uh, Burr had to resign from the Continental Army altogether because his health just hadn't recovered from him having a heat stroke. Hmm. Um, Burr went back to studying law, and he was no longer affiliated with the Army. But he did still help when he was needed, and he did a lot of intelligence and reconnaissance missions kind of on the outside for George Washington. George Washington would kind of call on him and he would, you know, go behind enemy lines per se and, and get some information. Theodosia Barto Prevost came into Burr's life in 1778. She was married to Jacques Marcus Prevost at the time, who was on the British side in Georgia trying to keep the colonies in line. <laughs> Theodosia was in New Jersey, and Burr was keeping her bed warm while her husband was away. So they say. Mm -hmm. She was 10 years older than Burr. and So it went from really young to... Oh, Older. yeah, he went in the opposite direction. And then, don't worry, because later he goes in the opposite direction. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> um, and each time, the gap just gets bigger. It's, it's just, so, okay. So she was 10 years older uh, than Burr, and with Burr leaving the Prevost house at all times of the day and night, rumors started. As they do. Yes. The two were then openly a couple in 1780. And Theodosia's husband died in 1781 in hmm. Jamaica from wounds that he had suffered during the war previously. So it wasn't wounds that he suffered in Jamaica. It was previously, you know, done that then just kind of spilled over, I guess, to later in life, kind of kind of like a lot of these people do. But yeah. So, yeah, um, they were definitely in a relationship for, from so 1778 was when they met. Mm -hmm. So then 1780 was when they were open. Right. So two years. And then 81 is when her husband dies. So four years. Yes, four years. Uh, 
The new couple married in 1782 and welcomed their daughter, Theodosia, in 1783. Unfortunately, Burr's wife was sick for several years. She could have had stomach or uterine cancer, but it's mm. unknown. Because that wasn't yeah, widely diagnosed. Yeah, but she was very, very sick. And based off of uh, all of the reports and everything that I've seen uh, for that time, you know, she... They think that based off of the symptoms, that's right. likely what it would have been. Um, so she passed away in 1794 when her daughter would have been 11 years old. Okay. And Lots of parents dying and leaving kids. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. So in the same year of his nuptials, Burr passed the bar and started practicing law when the British finally took off and left Manhattan. Because mm-hmm. it took them a few years, in case people don't know. So even though that the war was over, the British were still occupying New York at the time, and they because that's kind of where they set up station. Mm-hmm. Like we said before in, in the previous episode, when King's College closed, it was because the British had taken over New York City. Right. And it's because it was it was Manhattan. It was the best direct line from Great Britain mm-hmm. to the U.S. because uh, it was right there, you know, kind of on the coast, and so it and it was closer, you know, than than Boston or anything like that. So for a lot of this time, even though the war was over, the British were still there, yeah. And so it was kind of this weird in between time where, like, who's in charge? Is it the <laughs> Patriots or are the British? Because the British are still here right. and they're not leaving. Um, and actually, it was George Washington who came back to New York and, like, ran him out. He's okay, like, like, bye. Get out of here. Yeah. Go. So uh, when all that happened, uh, Burr passed the bar, and he started practicing law. He served on the New York Assembly and fought to have slavery abolished right when the war officially ended. He did not make it far. Um, <laughs> at the time, this was a new nation. It was not really a it wasn't really a time to go ahead and start like making big, big changes, changes. Yeah. and especially economical changes. Right. And while slavery is atrocious, we just, dis- we discussed that in episode three. Right. We're not, we're not fans no. of it. Not saying that it this, should be a thing. This was just it. I feel as though he could have waited a little bit longer for a better time and maybe it would have been more received. Yeah. And at that time, it's just kind of one of those things like it's too soon. But also you have a lot of the men who are in charge who were slave owners. Mm-hmm. Like Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, while it's admirable what he tried to do at that time, it's just kind of like, it was a little soon guy, yeah. like a little soon. So Burr went on to become the Attorney General of New York State and then beat Philip Schuyler for his seat in the legislature and became a senator. So he's moving up the ladder. Right. He's getting there quick. and He's got ambition. Yeah, he does have ambition, and he's kind of getting there any way he can because, keep in mind, he took Philip Schuyler's seat, and... They were not the same political party, which is not how that works. Nope, nope. So Burr basically wormed his way in to his seat mm-hmm. by kind of deceiving people as to what his political party was. Right. Um, he kind of just saw an opportunity and took it. <laughs> so not, not great. So Burr was prominent in politics in New York, and he ran for president in 1796, but he came in dead last. Poor guy. I mean, somebody has to. I mean, I guess. Uh, Three years later, he dueled John Barker Church, Angelica's husband, Uh because Church said that Burr had taken bribes for his political position. Oh. Yeah, so... It was kind of at the time Burr was making such giant leaps Mm -hmm. in politics and in this, you know, new climate that people started going, why are you getting there so fast? And so, yeah, so 
And which, if you remember too, John Church was also the name of one of Alexander, right? His children. So yeah, that's where the name John Church came from. Because it sounds weird when you're reading Alexander Hamilton's kids' names. Yeah, because it's like John Church. That's a name. That's not. Yeah, <laughs> no, his name was John Church, and he was named after his uncle. Yes. Um. So either way, both men shot and missed each other. And afterward, Church actually apologized to Burr and said that he shouldn't have accused Burr without proof. Interesting. Which is interesting. It is interesting because, you know, if you know anything really uh, about duels in that time, there's, which, and I should have included this um, in here, and I meant to, and I don't know why I didn't, but so in this time, duels were very how would you say it? They're very structured. Yes. There's a... There's definitely a code of conduct yes. for them. They there are ten dual order. commandments. Yes. And so, yeah. And if you listen to Hamilton, there's they, they go through the ten dual commandments, which, um, you know... It simplifies, but lays out how structured it is. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you have to come forward and, you know, kind of basically... You have to bring your seconds in and they have to, which your second is kind of like your friend, your friend that you brought with you, kind of just your buddy, your backup, your hot man. Right. And so at that time, um, you know, you would bring in your second and then they would be the ones that would go forward to the other second and say, hey, can we? Come to an agreement? Yes, no, maybe yeah. so. Can we compromise a little here? And, you know, then from there, if you could compromise, you could, you know, move forward from that, then... The Nobody duel, had to shoot. The duel would be over. It would be done. Um, so, unfortunately, in a lot of cases, that did not happen. Or if it did... There still might have been some fighting. Well, I mean, if it gets to the point of an actual mm-hmm. duel, mm-hmm. usually um, you don't have a cool head and mm-hmm. your emotions are very much tied into it. And there's a um, uh, the element of your honor, your pride, your, you know, your honor right. and your family name. And, you know, <laughs> you can't be seen as less than. All that reminds me of is like in old time, like older times when... Uh, like men would walk up to other men and like slap them in the face with their glove. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like throwing, throwing the gauntlet. It's like I could just see Burr and he's like dishonor on you. Dishonor, dishonor on, on you, you cow. cow. <laughs> like <laughs> we also love Disney. Yeah. So I can totally see how, you know, in 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 this it's very interesting but yes so you have to bring a doctor um you have to bring your second with you you have to at the beginning of the duel count off 10 steps either way um kind of the men start back to back then take 10 steps and turn around then everyone else which we'll talk about uh kind of more about this in a bit but everyone else has to turn around with their back to the duel to um so they can have deniability and then you Basically, shoot at each other, and from there, you decide whether you're going to delope, which we talked about in the last episode, Mm -hmm. where you either shoot in the sky or you shoot at the ground, Mm -hmm. to just basically that saying, I'm not backing down from the duel, but I'm also not going to shoot you. It's kind of a way of like, we're not going to agree, and we're not going to come to an understanding, so we kind of have to go forward with it. But I don't want to kill you. But I don't want to kill you. Which makes no sense to me. So then just move on. Well, like, but it's, it it's a whole pride I know. thing. I, it's, whole... It's, it's, just take a glove and slap the other man with it and be done with it. Or <sighs> my mother always, with, I talked about my mom before. She is, she is very even, even keel, wonderful, pleasant lady. Um, but she, uh, she has always wanted to slap somebody in the face with a fish. Which is so funny to me. That would be amazing. I mean, it, I think it'd be kind of satisfying. But she, she just that's something she wants to do. She wants to do that and to ride on an elephant. 
behind his ears, like not have to sit on a little cage on his back, but actually like behind his ears. Those are her two bucket list items. Interesting. So there you go. I mean, I could see it. Be kind of fun. Slapping somebody with a fish would probably be kind of fun. I mean, it'd be a good smack, don't you think? I it would be. I d- hmm. never thought about that before. Now it's on your bucket list. Now it's it might be on my bucket list. Now. <laughs> don't slap me with a fish, I, though. I, yeah, I won't slap you with a fish. Don't uh, slap me. Period. <laughs> no, you just said don't slap you with a fish. Well, you I did fixed, not say all together. I fixed it. I fixed it. <laughs> <laughs> so. So anyways, like we said, they, you know, Church then apologized to Burr, said he shouldn't have done it without proof. Um, And then Burr went on to start the bank of the Manhattan Company, which we discussed in episode one. All this just tying together. So at the time, there were only two other banks in New York, but they were started by Federalists. And Burr was a Democratic Republican Um, at the time. Anyways, at the time, he ended up changing parties, but he flip flopped to what? Bert, yeah, he did what his needs. He did what was best for him. So, <laughs> uh, this kind of goes into a little bit more in detail that I didn't do in episode one. Um, but so the banks were mainly owned by the Federalists, and so there was the Federal Government's Bank, which was the Bank of the United States, and then Hamilton's Bank of New York. Um, But Burr starting the Manhattan Company did not come without sketchiness and pushbacks because Burr decided he was going to be sketchy. So Burr asked Hamilton and other Federalists for support to start the company because, you know, needed backing. But Burr said it was to establish a water company for Manhattan. Oh. And this is kind of what we discussed before with the quote where he said it's the worst deal since the American Revolution right. you know, to happen. So he said it was going to be for a water company. At the last minute, Burr changed the charter Just application kidding. and included that the company could invest surplus funds in any way they wanted. As long as it didn't violate state laws and it removed the water company entirely. So he was accused, obviously, of acting dishonorably and it delayed the water system being established in Manhattan, um, like by a lot. And that's actu- what he was supposed to have been doing right. and why people backed him. Mm-hmm. And at the time, which um, around this time when the water company was trying to be established a really big uh, kind of epidemic of malaria went Mm. through New York city and, you know, malaria kind of comes from stagnant water and, you know, mosquitoes and, and things like that. So when he didn't start the water company as he stated, he was going to then, you know, it's kind of led to believe that he caused this nice epidemic nice. through New York. Before we did discuss the election of 1800 um, in episode one, so I'm not going to totally repeat everything mm-hmm. here, um, but to sum it up, Hamilton put his support behind Jefferson instead of Burr, and Burr lost. Uh, Burr did become vice president under Jefferson, but Jefferson kind of shut Burr out of a lot of dealings because he didn't trust him. Yep. Um, If the election of 1800 was the straw that broke the camel's back for Burr and Hamilton, then the Charles Cooper letter poured gasoline onto a fire. Uh Mm Uh-oh. Mm-hmm. You know... Things were already strained and, you know, kind of Burr was already mad because he was getting shut out of everything and he wanted to be in the room where it happened. Right. And it was Hamilton's fault. All Hamilton's fault. Right. So. None of his own. No, never. So April 24th of 1804, the Albany Register published a letter, which can I just say, why are all these newspapers publishing letters from people and between people? Mind your business. Well. 
that's kind of like tabloids now. I mean, think about it. I mean, they were like the original National Enquirer. It's ridiculous. I mean, (laughs) all of these different things. It's just like, why? Why y'all got to mess with people? Yeah. And all y'all are doing is just causing issues. But, I mean, remember, they didn't have television. They didn't have radio. This was how they got all the information. Yeah, so, but sometimes you just got to stay out I of mean, it. it's like the Maury Povich show, you know? <laughs> right. I am just that saying. Good show. Miss Maury. It's <laughs> a good one. <sighs> So, like I was saying, April 24th, 1804, the Albany Register published a letter, um, and that letter was between Charles Cooper and Philip Schuyler, who was Hamilton's father-in-law. In the letter, uh, Cooper stated, quote, General Hamilton and Judge Kent have declared in substance that they looked upon Mr. Burr to be a dangerous man and one who ought to not be trusted with the reins of government. Burr quickly wrote a letter to Hamilton, and he was set off by the comment that he was more despicable. And Burr demanded a prompt and unqualified acknowledgement or denial of the use of any expression which would warrant that assertion from Dr. Cooper. Hmm. Basically, Hamilton, you better have a real good excuse for why this man says you said this. Yeah. You know, (laughs) you're going to deny it? Hamilton's reply, did I stutter? Did I? Yeah, it's, uh, (sighs) God love him. So, (laughs) again, pride, 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 pride. In Hamilton haughty fashion. Hamilton replied that he could not be held responsible if Dr. Cooper misinterpreted his words. Even if I said what you think I said. Yeah, and uh, Hamilton never denied saying them and told Burr that if he was not happy with the answer, then Hamilton would, quote, abide the consequences. Mm. Burr replied, quote, Political opposition can never absolve gentlemen from the necessity of a rigid adherence to the laws of honor and the rules of decorum. Hamilton replied that, quote, that he had, quote, no other answer to give than that which has already been given. I said I what said. I said. I mean... It's, I mean, gosh, that's one of my so favorite memes, I know, too. I know. It's just, it's so funny. And it's, even if I said what you think I said. You would need to cite a more specific grievance. Here's an itemized list. Of 30 years of, of disagreement. disagreement. Sweet Jesus. <laughs> um, which would not surprise me at all. If, no. he, if Hamilton was just like, here you go. I kept the scroll all this time. Yeah. All of our, all of our. Bad blood between one another. So then Burr challenged Hamilton to a duel, and Hamilton accepted. It was July 11th of 1804. The two men rowed rowed across the Hudson at dawn in separate boats to Weehawken, uh, which was in New Jersey. So both New Jersey and New York had outlawed dueling at this time, mm-hmm. but they still chose to go to New Jersey because. Everything is legal in New Jersey. But in, rea- yeah. but in reality, New Jersey was just known to not be as aggressive at prosecuting anyone who right. was involved in a duel. So they figured that, you know, it would be better for them to go there than for them, you know, to duel in New York and possibly be, you know, prosecuted really punished. heavily for yeah. for doing it because they time. were prominent members of society right they were and so yeah they um these as i said in the last episode were the same dueling grounds that philip hamilton fought on just three years prior yep the men were also using the same guns used between philip and george eaker yep and it said that the guns belonged to Hamilton's brother-in-law. 
That's Church. how they got them. So, um, but yeah, same spot, same. same so wait, could gun. those have been the same guns that were used between the in the duel could between happen. Burr and Church? But I don't know if you could have owned the guns. I think that might have been part of the duel that you couldn't own the guns. Hmm. They had to be someone else, so Something you could make sure that. that, that right. Yeah, so you could make sure that nothing happened. You like, don't tamper. Yeah, with you them don't or tamper anything. with one of them. Hmm. So I think they had to be owned by somebody else. Um, but I'm not sure where they would have gotten the guns from. Um, for that one, just yeah. a thought. I mean, that yeah. would have been, you know, that's a pretty historical piece of. Yeah, exactly. History. Very historical piece of history. <laughs> well, historical <laughs> artifact. Right. Around 6.30 a.m., Burr arrived with his, quote, second, which was William Peter Van Ness. And Hamilton arrived with his second, Judge Nathaniel Pendleton and Dr. David Hosick around 7 a.m. And it was way too confusing to put in the previous part, but uh, Peter Van Ness and Pendleton were the two that were exchanging the letters to each other to give to Hamilton and Burr. So they were kind of like the go-betweens between okay. the two of them. So then they also served as their second. Uh, in Because they were kind of involved, invested in this whole affair, this whole deal. Right. So when they all arrived, um, there was another man that was there uh, with Burr. Um, and it says he was identified as John Swartout. That's how we're going to say it. Okay. Um, and when they got there, they started to clear underbrush from the dueling ground. Um, you know, there is speculation of who shot first. And by some firsthand accounts, they say they heard two shots. Mm -hmm. And others say they heard just one. So because of plausible deniability, which that's when everybody, you know, turned their backs. Right. All of the men had their backs turned during the duel. So there really isn't any way to know. Yeah. There's no actual first. accurate account because they didn't see. If you are in the one shot camp, which you should be because Burr shot first, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. <laughs> I don't care what the history book said, Burr shot first. And there is, we'll discuss it further, but there is evidence that that is a very, very good possibility, even though some people say, which I'll, anyways, I'll go into it in a second. Um, <laughs> don't get ahead of yourself. I'm getting ahead of myself. So yeah, if you were in the one shot camp, then Burr shot Hamilton as Hamilton was aiming his weapon to the sky in an effort to throw the duel. If you go off of the two shot theory, then Hamilton apparently fired a shot above Burr's head and it hit a tree. Mm -hmm. um, either way, Burr fired and hit Hamilton in the lower abdomen above the right hip. The bullet ricocheted off of Hamilton's ribs, and a fractured rib caused considerable damage to his internal organs, Ugh. particularly his liver and diaphragm. Um, and then it lodged into his lower lumbar vertebrae, possibly between the first and second. According to Pendleton, Hamilton collapsed almost immediately, dropping the pistol involuntarily. And then... It said that Burr moved towards Hamilton in a speechless manner before being hustled away uh, by his second Peter Van Ness. You're like, oh my gosh, what'd I do? Yeah, they said that, uh, you know, that he did kind of lunge forward to kind of like go to, you know, him. So as I said, Dr. David Hosick was there and he was the same doctor that treated Philip Hamilton. And he wrote an account of the duel and the aftermath, which I'm going to read. It is a very long quote, but it describes exactly to his recollection what happened that day. Um, he did write it about a month after the events happened and occurred. So there could be some things that could, you know, he's trying to remember. It was kind of a, right. a long situation, but he did write an account of, of the duel and the aftermath. And so I'm going to read it. It's very well written and, you know, well, kind of, the wheel. yeah, it goes in deeper into what happened and, and I couldn't really pull parts out of it because there was so much. So I just mm -hmm. decided we'll, we'll read the whole thing. When called to him upon his receiving the fatal wound, I found him half sitting on the ground, supported in the arms of Mr. Pendleton. 
His countenance of death I shall never forget. He had, at that instant, just strength to say, This is a mortal wound, doctor. He then sunk away and became, to all appearance, lifeless. I immediately stripped up his clothes And soon, alas, I ascertained that the direction of the ball must have been through some vital part. His pulses were not to be felt. His respiration was entirely suspended. And upon laying my hand on his heart and perceiving no motion there, I considered him as irrecoverably gone. I, however, observed to Mr. Pendleton that the only chance for his reviving was immediately to get him upon the water. We therefore lifted him up and carried him out of the wood to the margin of the bank, where the bargemen aided us in conveying him into the boat, which immediately put off. During all this time, I could not discover the least symptom of returning to life. I now rubbed his face, lips, and temples with spirits of heartsworn applied it to his neck and breast and to the wrists and palms of his hands. The endeavor to pour some into his mouth. Soon after recovering his sight, he happened to cast his eye upon the case of pistols and observing the one that he had had in his hand lying on the outside, he said, take care of that pistol. It is undischarged and still cocked. It may go off and do harm. Mm. Pendleton knows, attempting to turn his head towards him, that I did not intend to fire at him. Yes, said Mr. Pendleton, understanding his wish. I have already made Dr. Hosick acquainted with your determination as to that. He then closed his eyes and remained calm without any disposition to speak, nor did he say much afterward. Except in reply to my questions, he asked me once or twice how I found his pulse, and he informed me that his lower extremities had lost all feeling, manifesting to me that he entertained no hopes that he should survive. So, I mean, you said that the the bullet lodged between his vertebrae, so that would make sense. He was paralyzed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. And yeah, uh, the hawthorn or, or whatever he said, it's kind of like smelling salts yeah. from what I could understand. Um, so that was when he kind of revived him. But it's just so sad because, you know, he's sitting there and he's telling them, one, that's the gun that I had in my hand. It's not. He's basically saying he didn't shoot. It's still cocked and it's yeah. not discharged. So be careful when you're touching it. Right. And then two. Don't accidentally shoot somebody or something. Right. And then he tells Pendleton, you know who was his second, you know, I did not intend to fire at him. Like, please know that I I never intended to shoot him. Yeah. And that's when Pendleton's like, I know, you know, I know that you didn't. So. Which would further the one shot theory. Yeah. Which, and that's why there's, there's a lot of things that make me think the one shot theory happened. Um, I think that the two shot theory could have been an echo coming off mm-hmm. of the trees or something in that area, you know, when a when a shot is fired, it is very loud and it can echo off of things. So it could be that you could, you could think maybe you heard a second, but for him to say that the gun was still cocked, he didn't shoot. Yeah. The only, the only other explanation for the two shot theory to, to be, you know, because um, just like in the other duel, when mm-hmm. he was shot, it mm-hmm. could have been, you know, his from his body hitting the ground or convulsion or, you know, something right. as but a reaction gun, to that. Yeah. Yeah. But if the gun was still cocked. But was it? I mean, he, he said that it was, maybe not realizing that he had fired when as he was I shot. I mean, they said, I'm, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I, I'm just putting right, ideas no, here. I would think, personally, I would think with Dr. Hosick writing this, mm-hmm. I would think... If it weren't that he would have known, he would that. have said that. And I agree. I agree. I'm just trying to. Yeah, I, I yeah, I don't quite the reasons. I don't quite understand. And you know, also 
Keep in mind, the people who say there were two shots were on Burr's side. The right. one that said one were on Hamilton's side. Right. So it could be that the people who are saying there were two shots are trying to justify right. why he was shot. And, you know, there's really no telling as far as that goes, unfortunately. Yeah. We may never know. Mm-hmm. So before the duel, Hamilton wrote a letter entitled Statement on Impending Duel with Aaron Burr. In this letter, he said that he intended to throw away his shot and not shoot at him. Not that he didn't throw away his shot. I know. That's why I put that in there. (laughs) Um, He intended, yeah. So what he intended to do was to shoot off at the ground or at the sky, and he was not going to shoot again. Um, Because in... Further into a duel, if you are the first one to shoot and you miss and then they shoot, there's some kind of rule where you can then take another shot um, after that. So that's what he was saying is that he intended to throw it away and then he was not going to try and shoot him again. Mm-hmm. Um, so and then there is evidence that Burr intended to kill Hamilton. Yeah, he's mad. He had said it on several occasions. Uh, The afternoon after the duel, he was quoted as saying that he would have shot Hamilton in the heart had his vision not been impaired by the morning mist. Kind of incriminating. Mm Mm-hmm. So, and as we know, Aaron Burr is a little Mm flip-floppy. So. Mm -hmm. He kind of. Goes to the he goes with what benefits him, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which how this benefited him, I don't know, and we'll get into that. So Hamilton died the day after the duel, after seeing his wife Elizabeth and their children, and in the presence of more than twenty friends and family members, he passed away. Wow. He was buried in Trinity Church uh, in Manhattan. His political ally, Governor Morris gave the eulogy at his funeral, and established a private fund to support Eliza and the children since he had died. Um, And then at the same time, Burr initially fled to Philadelphia to avoid charges against him, but he was never tried for murder. Um, Burr hoped to restore his reputation and political career by dueling Hamilton but ultimately, it ended all of that. Yeah, did the opposite. So, and side story, fun fact, Leah and I have both been to Trinity Church. Yes, we have. Uh, at different times, yeah, not, not together. together but, but we did send pictures to we each did. other when we were there. We did. So we did go to <laughs> Trinity Church. We did see Hamilton's grave. We did see um, Angelica's. Uh, we did see Eliza's. They are buried, you know, right beside each other. Um, Hamilton's grave is very large. Yeah. Um, and people leave more pennies on money. it. Mm-hmm. Uh, people would leave pennies. People would leave money on it and stuff like that. Do you know why? Um, why? What did you? It Well, it's a, it's a custom, and I believe it's a Jewish custom, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah. Um, just to show that, that they were remembered. You know, yeah. They had been forgotten. Kinda, it's just a token. Sometimes you'll see a rock. Or, mm-hmm. or just something on there, and that's why. Kind of like in Hispanic tradition where they have an ofrenda, where it's like right. an offering for right. someone who's passed away. So, yeah, I could see that. I mean, I just saw – I mean, it's all around. Oh, yeah. We have photos of it. And I, when um, – if you all have seen, I do post photos from the episode uh, kind of in a little – just a little carousel thing on there. So you can see just Mm -hmm. kind of different things from it. And so I'll post a photo that I have um, of Hamilton's grave while I was there. It's very interesting Mm -hmm. to go there. It's very hidden. Yeah, like you have to know that it's there. And there are two Trinity churches, people. I'm going to go ahead and tell you right (laughs) now, because guess who went to the wrong one first? Oh, dear. Well, and also Trinity Church is also where if you love um, the movie National Treasure, Mm -hmm. um, you know, when when Sweet Riley says, who wants to go down the dark, creepy tunnel first? (laughs) That's also that church. Yes. And it's... um it was actually being renovated at the time that I was there. So Me I got too. to see parts of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, because you were there. About a year? A year before me, yeah, maybe. And so, yeah, it was under construction, so I didn't really get to see a whole lot. And they had just started the construction when I was there. They were, yeah, it was, I was so upset because I wanted to see it. Because I've seen the National Cathedral in D.C., and it's mm-hmm. amazing. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, it's 
there. So just fair warning, if you ever do decide you're going to go to Manhattan and find Hamilton's grave, if you see a Trinity church that is near the 9-11 memorial, it is not that church. I'm going to go ahead and tell you because I thought You can't knock them both out at the same time. No, I thought, well, because I was like, how weird. Trinity church is right here. because perfect. You know, I went to the 9-11, which... Everybody needs to go at least once. Oh, and if you were alive during the time, you you need to prepare yourself. There's it's some some rough. parts that I could not go through. It's rough. Um, I did not go into One World Trade. I didn't do that. I decided to do um, what you would call it. Now that I'm trying to say it, I can't say it. Anyways, I was going. I there. I'm. A lot of people don't know this about me. I'm deathly terrified of heights. I do not <laughs> like them. I I am not a fan. And there's this place that I know because I've looked at enough videos. Um, when you're in like the elevator at One World Trade and stuff, like there's all this crazy stuff like around on the walls and stuff as you're going up that mm-hmm. like show the city, but it's not the city. It's a photo. And then there's one place where you can kind of walk over it and it's like a screen, but it's like what it would look like if you look straight down at the ground. It, anyways, it's crazy. I don't like it. I'm not I didn't a fan. do that. Yeah, it's it's not a fan. <laughs> don't love it. So you're not going to go to the Grand Canyon. Nope. Um, but I did go to the other building. Yes, and that's what we. That's did. the one the, that I was the tour with the artifacts and everything. I'm trying. No, I'm trying. The um, it's gonna drive me insane. Short drive. Very short drive. They. I'm sorry, guys, if y'all are, like, screaming it in your car. It's the other building that is in New York that's very famous. You go to the top of it. Elf was filmed there. Empire State Building? Yes. Oh, my gosh. I told you. I know. Like, I had no idea. Because how could you not remember that? I blanked for some reason. (laughs) I blanked. I was like, I know this building. I was there. I stood. And if you can go at night, guys. Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, go at night. But, yeah, if you if you were alive during 9-11, if you felt the impact of that. I was younger when 9-11 happened, and I still vividly remember it. I can't talk about 9-11 a whole lot because I get very emotional mm-hmm. and very upset. And I am telling you that every year on the anniversary, they try and play that phone call and they sneak it up on you and I can't handle it. I don't listen to anything on the radio or anything yeah. on 9-11 because, and, and you'll know if you know 9-11, you know the phone call I'm talking about and it just starts with, hey, Jules, and I can't handle yeah. it. I will burst into tears every time. But if you could go to the memorial, yeah. it is very impactful. Be prepared. And, and that's the part that I couldn't go through was it yeah. was um, they have a room that plays messages. Mm-hmm. Oh, I can't. Uh-uh. And I, I was nope. like, yeah, I'll be skipping that. Nope. And at one point, I, I really, I, I was walking with some of my friends. I was actually there with our youth group mm-hmm. and I was walking with some of the people and I was like, I've got to make my way out because yeah. it, I'm overcome and overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. I had tears streaming down my face. You know, I was like, I, I can't, I can't take any more in. I, I, you know, it was just, it's ugh. a lot. The yeah. the um, American History Smithsonian Building in DC, mm-hmm. they sneak it up on you. Oh, that's not nice. And it it's because it's through like it's this whole section where they it's like the military and through time and which stuff, is I mean which not is that great it and wonderful. Be taught. It needs to be there, right? Absolutely. It needs to be there, and they have a piece of the World Trade Center in there. You just and need everything. to be prepared for it. And I'm telling you, mm. I walked in that room and I heard, "Hey, Jules!" I walked straight out yep. of that room. I was like, "I can't handle nope. this. Nope. I can't nope. listen to it. Yep. I can't do it." But like she said. If you could ever go, and I know this is on a tangent, but still, if you could ever go and you could see that monument, it's the weirdest place because it's like a bubble. Is that You don't hear the city at all. Yeah. It's like there's this certain space that you walk into and you just walked into a bubble. All you hear is water because it's it, there's fountains mm-hmm. and it's beautiful. And it's peaceful. It's very peaceful, but it's... It's eerie. It's emotional. It's emotional. Mm-hmm. And they, it, all the sound of the city is cut out. Yeah. It's so weird because then there's a point where you go to like walk out and it's like all Whoa. the city hits Everything's you at one time. Again. It's so crazy. But did yes, you watch beautiful. the video? Did you go, did you watch the movie oh, no. before? No. No. Oh, I did. No. 
So I was already like my, I, I was already just no. streaming because, I mean, you see, yeah. and my brother-in-law is a fireman. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. you know, when they show the picture of all of the first responders, he, he's, a, he's a paramedic fireman, you know, and not saying that I wouldn't feel as overwhelmed um, if I didn't have someone that I love that but was a fireman, you, yeah, you, you, you understand the connection. mentality. And I know, like, uh, Ladder 13, mm-hmm. you know, the last radio part that they heard was, you know, Ladder 13 continuing up. I mean, like, yeah. they, they knew what they were going into. And I know that that would be what Ryan would do. Because yeah. that's how those people are wired. They're the ones that run to the danger. Yeah. And that it takes it's, a special oh, person to absolutely. do that. Like it's it's very in, you know, it's it's a lot. But yeah, if yeah. you if if you decide you're going to go on a tour of New York City, you need to do that, but you need to be prepared. Bring your tissues with you. Yeah. Um yeah. Especially, and I don't mean to say this in in, in a bad or a negative way, but especially if you are a US citizen that was in the U.S. at that time. Mm-hmm. And remember it was, the day. It, it was a lot. It, it was, I mean. I had been married three months and I was at my first teaching job. It was, I, anyways, I can't, I can't think about it too much more. But, but yeah, it, it's, it's very difficult. But if you, if you go, go to the 9-11 Memorial, mm-hmm. go to Trinity Church, mm-hmm. not the Trinity Church by the <laughs> 9-11 Memorial. Going to go ahead and make sure that you're aware. Yes, yes. Um, the other Trinity Church is, uh, there is a, uh, oh, what is that thing called? There's CVSs, but they're not CVS. Walter Reed, I think, or something like that. Anyways, straight across the street, there's a CVS. And I know because I had to go to that CVS to get Band-Aids for my feet because I had blisters all over them. <laughs> um, it was great. Nice. So wonderful. Had to go buy a shoe. Had to find a Target in Manhattan to buy shoes. It, anyways, it was a whole ordeal. But it was an adventure. Uh, it was. But uh, no, Dwayne Reed. Sorry for go. any New Yorkers. Uh, yeah, Dwayne Reed um, is right across the street. So uh, if you see a Dwayne Reed directly across the street behind, straight across, you can see Hamilton uh, from there. There you go. Weird. But. Yeah, if you ever get a chance to go there, it is really cool. Um, it's just interesting to be there when it happened so long ago, 200 yeah. years. It's, yeah. it's a lot. And it, it's really neat to kind of be in that mm-hmm. part of history. I mean, I went to Scotland and, um, you know, most of the stuff in Scotland that you get, like the mm-hmm. castles and stuff, like it's older than our country. Right. And I remember standing in one of the castles and just, you know, looking at my mom and like, what when it really hit me was there was um, a stone stairwell, like a, a winding mm-hmm. one, and the stone steps had been worn away from walk- by yeah. so, many so many steps. People. And I was like, these steps are older than our country, oh, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. And you, you kind of get that overwhelming sense of awe when you see something like Trinity right. Church, and, you know, it brings these things that you've heard of, Brings it it to, makes it real. Makes it more real. Absolutely. It makes it not a story anymore. Exactly. So it's all right. We're gonna we'll end our rabbit trail there. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> oh well we both love New York, so we could probably talk about it forever. Um so anyways, uh and we eight, should road trip there. I, I'm not road tripping there, I can tell you that. <laughs> um I can mm-mm. mm mm. We'll fly there. I, I can barely road trip to New Orleans and back. I am not mm mm. Um So, in 1807, uh, this is after, this is kind of, now we're going to go through the aftermath of what happened um, after Burr's death, or not Burr's death, after Hamilton's death up until Burr's death. There There we go. So, in 1807, the Burr conspiracy came out. It was a plot alleged to have been planned by Aaron Burr in the years as vice president under Thomas Jefferson. According to the accusations against Burr, he attempted to use his international connections to establish an independent country in the southwestern United States and parts of Mexico. That's interesting. Burr's story was that he intended to use the 40,000 acres in Texas as a farm. I mean, that's a heck of a farm. 40,000-acre farm. So the land had been leased to him by the Spanish crown. Burr was arrested. Uh, this is actually, if you are from Alabama, and we do have some Alabama listeners, Burr was found and arrested 
in what is now Wakefield, Alabama, there. which is in Washington County, which is directly above Mobile County. Oh. So, yeah, that's where. And there's a um, <laughs> fun fact. Uh, a marker is placed by the Alabama Historical Association commemorating Burr's capture, just showing you how much Alabama will just dig for a historical marker anywhere. <laughs> so Burr was taken in on the grounds of treason, but was released due to there not being any hard evidence. Some claim that he intended to take parts of Texas and the newly acquired Louisiana Purchase for himself, Ooh. while others believed he intended to conquer Mexico or even the entirety of North America. Conquer Mexico. That, Mexico. that just sounds so funny. I'm sorry. Just see Leslie Odom going to Mexico, making his way down. Well, I, I know. His, so this ruined. <laughs> this, no, that's not the same one. I no, just not had quite. to say it. I know. I know. Um, this ruined Burr even further, and people all across the United States burned anything they could get their hands on that looked like Burr. They were burning anything that looked like him. Ooh. They were people were furious. After he was acquitted due to insufficient evidence, he went to Europe as kind of like a self-imposed exile yeah. until 1812. Well, I mean, people were burning likenesses of oh, him. Yeah. I'm just saying. Burr did marry again, um, July 1st of 1833, to a woman named Eliza Jumel. Again, maybe not how you say it. Don't know. Um, she was a widow who was 19 years younger than him. So like I said, he goes younger, goes older, goes younger. Yeah, well. (laughs) So she was wealthy, and after four months of marriage, she realized her money was disappearing (laughs) and that Burr was the one spending it. Shocker. So they separated. Hmm. She quickly filed a divorce, took a while for the divorce to actually go through, actually took, uh, I think, four, three years. Yeah, it took like three years for the divorce to finally go through. Um, I mean, because at that time, the only way to be a woman and be in charge of your money was to be a widow. Mm-hmm. So she had to hire a divorce attorney. Would you like to guess what divorce attorney she sought out and used in her divorce against Aaron Burr? Please tell me. Alexander Hamilton, Jr., <laughs> Which I just love that. Like that's that's the one part of this. That's like a dig. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Like I'm gonna go find him. You you look at him in the face as you sign these divorce papers. I'd like, oh, I love it. So yeah. Oh. yeah. So uh so Burr had a stroke in 1834 that left him immobile for the rest of his life. He died at a boarding house in Staten Island on September 14th, 1836. The boarding house he died in is actually the St. James Hotel now. Okay. Um, Burr was buried in Princeton, New Jersey, near his father. So, y'all stuck in with us this long. Wait, got a question. His father and mother were not buried in the same place? It didn't say that she was buried in the same place, but it's very uh, likely that she was buried near her father because, because they died. The time. Her mother father, and father died in the same year that she did, yeah, so, so it's it very possible they could, have, they could have been buried together. I was just curious. Um, so I told you there was a bonus. Bonus! Told y'all that there was a, a little thing that I had to throw in at the end. I promise, guys, we're almost there. You're sticking with us through our rabbit trails and all. But we appreciate that. So we've we've just got to quickly get to the real hero of the entire story that we are discussing. Would you do you know who I'm Please talking tell about? me. I'm on the edge of my seat, literally. Eliza Hamilton. Absolutely. And I have to um I have to take a minute to talk about her. Um, her father also died the same year that her husband did and only a few months later. Wow. Yeah. So same year. She stuck by Alexander through the Reynolds pamphlet and his infidelity. She loved him until the day she died. She was so devoted to Alexander and his writings that she wore a small locket around her neck containing pieces of a sonnet that Alexander wrote for her during the early days of their courtship. Oh, that's very sweet. That didn't get burned, huh? No. (laughs) So after his death, she went on to start uh, the Orphan Asylum Society Mm -hmm. in the city of New York, um, which started with 16 children. 
And before Eliza's death, it took in over 700 children during wow. that time. One of them actually went on to go to West Point. Um, Very cool. So, yeah, it was great. Um, the organization still exists today under the name Graham Wyndham, which works with at-risk youth in New York City. Eliza organized all of Hamilton's writings and petitioned Congress to publish all of her husband's writings constantly. When Eliza was in her 90s, 90s, <laughs> Congress agreed to purchase Hamilton's writings from Eliza, and they still sit in the Library of Congress today. And while she was in her 90s, she paired up with Dolly Madison and Louisa Adams to raise money to fund the Washington Monument. Elizabeth Schuyler Hamilton passed away on November 9th, 1854, at the age of 97. Wow. It is said that she was losing her memory right before she died, but she could vividly recall her husband without any issues. She outlived Hamilton by 50 years mm. and is also buried at Trinity Church by her sister Angelica and her son, Philip Hamilton. And close to Alexander. Yes. Right, it, right in the same area. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I can't, can't. They're just a few steps away. Yes, very few. So I can't. I can't talk about them and not talk about Eliza because right. had it not been for her, you would not have the Washington Monument, guys. Like she was the one that pushed for that. She was very mm -hmm. close with Washington as well, and she she did so many other things. And there, like I, I didn't have time to put it all in. We and could what have a strong whole woman she had to be. Ninety seven. Right. Well, and also all the turmoil in their life. I mean, the infidelity and, you know, standing by, you know, stand by your man. You know, I'm just saying I, I might have an issue with my, I mean, my, my it, husband. It's, it's just crazy. And, um, you but know, then losing a child and but then still raising a child. Mm -hmm. I mean, that you have to be strong. To and be losing to do your that. husband three years after you lose your child, losing your father in the same year. Yeah, so not only are hard. you a widow. You don't have your dad who could help you. Yeah. He's gone too because her dad was very wealthy. He was very well off. He was mm -hmm. very well known in the city. So all of these things, and you still have seven children. Yeah. That you've got to care for. Then. But now at this time, her older children, you know, especially. They were the not that much older though. So keep in mind that little Phil was born the year after his right. brother died, which would have been 1801, 02, 02. Um, so she had a two-year-old when Hamilton died. So there's 20 mm -hmm. years between the oldest and the youngest. So at minimum, and all of her kids based on birth dates, there's like a, uh, like the first four, I think were born within two years of each other. Right. And then the last ones, there was more of a gap, like three to four years. So at, most the oldest child still in her house would have been around 16. Yeah. But at that, at that time, yeah. uh, you know, one that age right. would be able to help. So, right. Yeah. So that would be able to help. But even, I mean, still like you got a two year old now you've got, I mean, your yeah. dad and your husband died in the same year. Um, I mean, it's just, it's insane. And then she goes on to live 50 more years, yeah. 50 more years and I did in this read. time. Yeah. And I did She read. birthed eight children. Ugh. I'm not sure if y'all are, I don't, I don't think mm. that's gotten through your head. That's she, a lot. That's too many. But anyways, <laughs> she made it through all these things and lived to be 97. Yeah. But what I think is interesting, you know, some of the reading that I've done, the kids, um, like the, the younger, like little Phil, he didn't have the benefit of the same benefits that his older brothers did as far as education, just mm -hmm. having money wise to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So they're even though they had the same parents, their whole childhood was different. Very much so. Yeah. It's it's just insane. And I like I said, I couldn't talk about all of this without giving a few few moments to Eliza. Because she's just amazing. Um it's just insane to do as much as she did. Yeah. In the time she was alive and with no help. Yeah. I mean, you know, with no help. So that wraps up our two parter, guys. We're, we made it through episode six. Woohoo. Thanks for <laughs> hanging in there. Yes. Um, the next one is it's not a two parter. So it's a little bit, and it's uh, one y'all haven't heard of, I'm sure. So I'm sure I haven't. I'm sure you have. <laughs> so. 
So follow us on Instagram at One Nation Under Crime and on Twitter at ONUC Pod. If you love our podcast as much as we do, please follow us on your preferred podcast platform and recommend us to everyone you know. Yes. Anyone. Uh, and if you feel like it, leave us a five star review on Apple Podcasts. We'd appreciate it. Um, we do have a Patreon. If you, for some reason, love us enough to help with the cost of making and hosting the show, you can donate there. You can go to patreon.com, search for One Nation Under Crime. Uh, if you have a question for us or just a really good story you want to tell us, uh, you can email us at One Nation Under Crime at gmail.com. We'd love to read them and we will reply. So, thanks for listening to this week's episode and the second part of the duel of we hawking there you go we appreciate it and we will see you here same time different crime next week and remember there isn't always liberty and justice for all we'll see you guys next week bye